Thank you for downloading the Start the Week podcast from BBC Radio 4. For more information, go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. Hello. Think of your friends. Can you recognise their handwriting? When did you last see their handwriting? Have you ever? Today we're going to be talking about what may be becoming a lost art and asking whether it really matters. The venerable author Diana Atthill published her letters to a poet friend in New York instead of a book, she called it, and during the long correspondence she moves from paper to screen. The poet, Wendy Cope, has written quite a lot about writing, postcards, flyleaf inscriptions, the poetry itself, but her archive, sold to the British Library, contains, apart from 15 boxes of paper, about 40,000 emails. Nigel Warburton, who lectures in philosophy and is a leading light of the Twitterati, is relaxed and enthused by the new penless, pencil-free world. But we're going to start with the man whose new book has set us on this week's path, the novelist and critic Philip Henscher, who has written The Missing Ink, a history of handwriting with elegiac notes and a brief manifesto for its revival. Philip, you pose the question about how much handwriting we see these days, and it's a good one. I'm sure lots of people will be thinking about it uh, already. But it's certainly the case that handwriting is still being taught in schools, isn't it? To a certain extent. I think there's uh, there's some requirement in the national curriculum that, um, that students learn to write, but there's less and less enthusiasm for it. For years, there's been a strong argument that um, children don't need this anymore, they should just learn to type. And the research that has gone into um, educational theory that demonstrates quite convincingly that if children learn how to make a letter with pen and ink, that that leads on to all sorts of creative thinking, to a deeper engagement with words, to a bit, of, bit more understanding of how things, how things are written. Um, all that seems to be swept aside in the kind of grasp of this brave new world of mm. texting and typing and emailing. Well, let's probe that a little further, because some people would say this is uh, romanticism, this is sentimentality, the smell of the paper, the feel of the ink, you know, the, 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 the heft of a pen or a pencil in your finger, all wonderful, all sensual, but actually not necessarily much to do with thinking or indeed uh, writing words. Well, sentimentality is just a word that you use for a feeling that you're declining to join in with, I think. Um, <laughs> Uh, let me give you an example. A couple of weeks ago, I was I picked up an old copy of Vanity Fair that I'd had for decades, and out of it fell a little handwritten note that my sister had left for me when I was in hospital, when I was mm. 15, and I must have been reading Vanity Fair. It was just a completely unremarkable note saying, I saw that you fell asleep, and I'm just, oh, I'll be back later today. Hope you're mm. feeling better. Love, Kate. And that was it, really. Now, that was from 32 years ago. It was absolutely full of her personality. I saw it and I knew immediately who left it for me. If she'd sent me a text message, would I still have it after 32 years? Would I still have that connection to my past, to her past, to our relationship? I wonder. I asked about, uh, right at the beginning, how many people could recognise their friend's handwriting, but recognising something about the personality... Um, in the handwriting is very much part of the case you make. Yes, it's uh, it's a fraught case because the science of graphology is so eccentric and people making um, points about how good someone is with money from the angle of their capital H or whatever. But there's no doubt that when we see a piece of handwriting, someone we know well, or even someone we've never met before, um, we have some kind of sense of their humanity. There's some mm. sense of what they might be like as human beings. I think some of these things we all agree on. I think if you saw somebody whose handwriting leans backwards, then you often have the sense they might be a little bit withdrawn. If they um, if they paint their letters, if they don't join up, often I think the people are very uh, are probably a little bit visual, visually um, um, inclined. They're obviously often visually creative. Um, but and if to, they put, and if they put little hearts instead of dots above their eyes, then somebody ought to have a word with them. <laughs> <laughs> um, part of your book is very, is the fascinating history of the teaching of handwriting and all the various methods and gurus and so on who became popular um, and and persuaded people to teach in different kinds of ways. So so, so there is a um, there's a generational and indeed geographical issue here about how people handwrite. 
But there's also, I, I get the sense that you worry there is um, a sort of benighted egalitarianism behind the hostility of some people to handwriting, that because some people's handwriting is semi-legible illegible, or it betrays um, a kind of lack of full education, they then feel um, put down and ergo, we should all be using keyboards. It's interesting, isn't it, how people... Well, I discovered this when I was talking to people for the book, how often people say, I'm very ashamed of my handwriting. And there are lots of things that, that are very personal to you that you don't feel ashamed about at all. People don't say they're ashamed of the, the clothes they wear, for instance. Um, but, yes, it, it does feel very personal. It feels like a, um, a revelation of self. And so people do feel um, if there was some way to avoid it, um, then that might be a good thing. The 19th century uh, handwriting teachers saw the teaching of handwriting in very positive ways. They saw them as a way to uh, for people to improve themselves morally, to reach some kind of self... Seriously. It was, it, no, it seriously, was. You make yes. this point. It was, it, it was a full-scale way of you know, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps or Absolutely. rather by your ink. And um, the, um, the, the great 19th century reform Thomas Spencer, the American, um, he actually said that uh, handwriting was the means that took him away from drinking. He became teetotal and became a handwriting expert, uh, one thing after the other. Um, the, later, the later experts, like Ann Palmer, they saw it more as a kind of corporate way forward, um, learn to write perfect Palmerian script and become rich. Mm -hmm. And I think that as it, time goes on, there's often a feeling that if you concentrate on your handwriting, if you take pleasure in it, if you take pride in it, then and that's some kind of way of self-fulfilment. Now, I mentioned earlier on that you're a novelist, but you also teach at university level. What about the, um, the, the handwriting issues when it comes to essays, when it comes to exams? I was certainly of the generation where everybody had to handwrite and the handwriting had to be at least legible enough for the, the supervisor to be able to read it. Well, it's a long time since I've seen a handwritten essay. Really? Actually, they all type now. Mm -hmm. um, however, I do insist as a creative writing teacher that, um, that they have a little notebook that they take around with them, that they scribble in it as they go, that they make observations. And initially, students complain about like, that like mad. They can't bear it. Um, but as it goes on, they get the habit of it. They like the, um, they like the way that they can just get out a tiny notebook and just scribble a tiny reminder in it. Um, I think that you... Um, you have a lot more sense of your own creativity by focusing on your engagement between pen and ink and paper than you do with um, with just um, uh, texting and or um, or writing something on a computer. Just before we open this up, um, towards the end of the book, you have a sort of little mini manifesto there. You say you can, we, we can all, uh, if we want, if we value handwriting, we can all return. Uh, handwriting uh, into our daily lives again. Yes, it's important to say that I, I don't think we should give up on these wonderful things like email and and you know electronic communication. Very very um, important. But um, I think that um, everyone should try to write something by hand every day. People should write postcards from holiday. People should write love letters to each other. You should even write little shopping lists to yourself because there's pleasure in these um, in these ancient technologies uh, Diane Atthill you um, started off handwriting letters do you still write every day by hand or have you now moved entirely to keyboards no I write combination now but I begin everything by hand because it's just if I have something to write nowadays I'm not writing a new book but if I've got a, a review to write and I'm not really quite sure what I'm going to say. The way I discover what I want to say is by starting to write by hand. And I find that there is a real connection between the brain and the hand. And suddenly it starts going. And suddenly I get it. I never would get this by typing. Once I'm about, once I'm into it, I may go straight onto the, onto the um, mm. keyboard. Mm. But I like best to write it completely by hand first then on the keyboard, then come off, then revise it by hand, then go back onto the now keyboard. Now, that's, 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 that's an interesting, intricate little dance of... Because of I can't actually risk. judge it on the screen properly. Oh. I have to see it on paper. Oh. This is pure habit, I think, mm. just to people of my generation. Wendy Cope, when you're writing 
a poem, mm -hmm. hand or keyboard? Oh, I handwrite all, all the early drafts of my poems. And then when I think it's more or less finished, I will type it out on the computer screen and then but then there'll be a process of fiddling with it and sometimes I will print it out and make handwritten amendments and then That's change exactly them the on the um, but I write all all my poems I use a hardback notebook because I don't lose early draft you know because you can you might want to go back to an earlier draft um and uh, I don't know if it's superstition, but I can't really... I mean, I think well, what I was you going said, to ask whether yeah. it's just habit or whether there's, it's an important part of the creative process. Um, I haven't really tried writing a poem straight off on a computer. Mm. Um, so it may be superstition. But it's also partly that I don't want to become computed. I don't have to take a computer with me everywhere. One of the wonderful things about being a poet is that all you need is a piece of paper and a writing implement. I also wondered, a poem has a relationship to the sort of space of paper around it as well. And I wondered whether a screen is different. It's just, it's, well, you, you, you can't quite see the amount of margin and so on. At a certain point, I want to know what it's going to look like printed. And so that, at that point, I will want to type it. Philip. May I ask, Wendy, do you feel, as I do with creative work, that there's a danger that, with the wonders of a computer, that it looks too finished too early? It looks as though it's... It's beautifully printed, as almost as though it's in a book. So you don't really feel that it's the raw material that it is. No, because when I've when I've got a poem on the go, I'll be going over it in my head. You know, I can be doing the washing up or working in the garden. I'll be going over it in my head, and then I think, oh no, that line. You know, I think it's finished. This is what always happens. I think it's finished, and then I realise, saying it to myself, that line isn't quite right, or that word isn't quite right. Damn, I've got to do a bit more work. Let's bring in Nigel Warburton. Isn't there a a danger that you generalise from your own case. So you, you like writing by hand, Philip, and then you say, well, writing by hand is superb. Um, I, I share uh, Diana's way of writing, or I did originally, where I'd, I'd like to write by hand, type it up, print it out, edit it. But actually I've discovered now that um, the screens have got better, I can edit on the screen and go directly to typing. But that's just my case. I mean, different writers do different things and sometimes they fetishise the way they write, which allows them to get into the habit of writing. But we shouldn't generalise. I mean, different writers can do it different ways and probably the best advice I ever had as a writer was don't get wedded to just one way of doing it so you can only do it on yellow paper with a particular fountain pen. Learn to do it wherever you, you, you get the ideas. Yes, I think, there's, I think you're it's absolutely right. I don't think it's ever fair to say to people, this is how you must write. We don't really know. It's only from personal experience. On the other hand, I do think that there are particular faults that novels particularly that have been written on a computer have. And I, can, I think I can identify a novel that's been written on a, on a word processor because the sentences are bloated or... It's, well, I'm not sure. I, I, think, I think one of the big attractions of word processing is you can ruthlessly rip through what you've written before and, mm. and pull it tighter. And uh, I certainly find for the editing of, of writing a book or something, it's absolutely essential. Well, that's a very good way of approaching it. But it's quite common to read a, a novel nowadays where you can see that a clause has been dropped into the middle of a sentence and... and too much cutting and of, pasting yes, going too on. much cutting and pasting. Um, I was very interested also what Philip was saying, Diana, about, about graphology, because underlying the case for handwriting, it's very much the sense that there is some relationship between our personalities, our temperaments, our character, on the one hand and the way we form letters well, on the page. Well, obviously is, because one can pick up an envelope and say, oh, here comes a letter from Dolly. <laughs> anyway, mm. You know it's hers. And when a stranger writes to you, you can look at it and think, yuck. <laughs> yeah. Or, that looks interesting. I mean, if I'd had an envelope from Hitler... Mm. Whose who's, who's writing would, appears in Philip's book, an example of his yes. writing. Is, I would thrown it away without opening it, I think. It's so revolting, that writing. It is revolting. It is, even though, I mean, I think that is true, even if one hadn't known that it was his writing. Yeah. The it's poisonous. I think the interesting case that I saw was um, uh, one of the uh, September the 11th bombers, his last letter to his girlfriend, and it's the most unformed, chaotic writing. It's clearly somebody in terrible mental confusion, really. But Hitler is a, a great favourite of graphologists over the decades, some of whom make startlingly stupid observations about him. I think the, my favourite one was the one who said that there was a great significance in the fact his writing leaned so far to the right. <laughs> <laughs> Nigel. Isn't there a danger, though, that 
you become an amateur graphologist. You start reading all this stuff into the words that you see written. And certainly in, in my profession, you know, I, I teach philosophy. We have to mark exams which are handwritten. And it's it's terribly dangerous to have all these theories about the kind of person who writes with a particular script, the kind of person who underlines certain oh, things, oh, yes. because you end up doing them in injustice. Probably almost unconsciously, you read things into the text which are not in the words that are, that are being written, it, it, but are in the style of its expression. Is it possible to to, to have an essay in a kind of childish, unformed, chaotic hand and not mark it down as a result. Is it possible to screen that out? I well, wonder. I think I've been conscious of the contrast between the handwriting and the assumptions that you make and the content. But you have to realise that there may be all kinds of reasons why people write in that way. I have to say, I, I will point out in my own defence, I would never, ever do this as in, in my professional capacity. And actually being aware of your own judgments about about handwriting actually helped me to avoid that sort of judgment. Diana. The person I knew who did a lot of judging what people were like from their writing didn't do it at all from the point of view of saying, I have a theory that this is this and this. He said the thing to do was to give a very quick look and you got it. Are we, are we talking about but, but V.S. Talking Naipaul? About Vidya Naipaul yeah. who was uncannily accurate about people. We tested him several times because his wife, who was a teacher at a school, used to always, if people were applying for jobs, used to always give the, the, the letter to Vidya to look at. And he told us this, and we were laughing and thinking of probably an exaggeration. So we often tested him, and he was absolutely, extraordinarily accurate. Yeah. He could tell whether when someone had written something, they were ill. Your book, Diana, uh, instead of a book, um, of, of letters to your friend, the poet uh, Edward Field in New York and his partner. Um, there's one bit of a letter I'm going to read because it's a wonderful uh, counter-argument to the, the, the case for trying to improve your own handwriting. And then we'll talk a little bit more about the book. Dearest Edward, you say, I no longer feel I should apologise for handwriting after your compliments on same. I owe it to Nicholas Bentley, who wrote in italic hand so exquisite. There are examples of it in the Victoria and Albert Museum. When I exclaimed about it, he told me his natural hand had been an evil and illegible scrawl, so he deliberately taught himself italic. So I bought the requisite pen, worked away. My natural hand was large and loopy like loose knitting, and you were soon able to write what you say is a pretty italic, but only very slowly, so at last I couldn't be bothered any more, but the loose knitting had been tightened up for good, except when I'm scribbling notes, and then it turns into unravelled knitting. The natural hand is gone for good. Who knows what psychic damage this represents? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I have three handwritings, because I have the natural hand, no snitting. I have a rather pretty handwriting for writing letters, and I have my hand as a c editor, so printer's read, which is tiny and absolutely infallibly legible. And I sometimes use that on postcards. It's very useful. So hmm. I can't tell, really. What I've got. You were you were seduced away from handwriting to uh, emails and so on uh, later in the collection. Do you it, really think it made much difference to the did. kind of you it did? Did yes. The, the letter started. The com communication went off the boil. I mean, we're, we're still dear friends, and we still communicate all the time. But but much much briefer, much more. Did such and such last week, longing to see you, that sort of thing. Mm. Because the the, the letters um, seem to me to be... The interesting thing about them is they are utterly sort of um, expansive and personal and probably saying things that you wouldn't actually say to those nearest and dearest around you about ageing and the details about it, those wonderful, wonderful letters about the sort of flush of fantastically happy moments that some, somehow come to you. Well, one would say them to Edward, <laughs> but, you not, would. but not to a lot of people. Yes. But it, it, it was very personal. I do think that writing by hand is more personal than writing on a machine, but this is, you know, I'm old, I'm used to it, I've done it forever. Wendy, you um, clearly use a lot of emailing, and we'll come on to the, the archive later on. Do you still write letters or postcards by hand? I don't write letters by hand, and I stopped doing that a long time ago, even before I had a computer. Mm. Um, I don't actually like having to handwrite anything that's for public consumption. 
because I'm not very proud of my handwriting. Oh, okay. um, I have one friend who sends me notes in beautiful, beautiful handwriting, and I always feel rather threatened by this and think, oh, goodness, am I supposed to send a handwritten note back? But I don't. I mean, sometimes I get asked, charities sometimes ask me to handwrite a poem for them to put in an auction. Mm -hmm. um, it raises a surprising amount of money, so I don't like to say no, but I hate doing it because I have to do it so slowly and then I go wrong and then I have to start again and, um, yeah... But, but if we agree that um, there is something personal and revealing about handwriting, you know, whether it's scientific or not scientific, but there is something there, and therefore one can get a fantastic sort of flush of excitement, either from a relative's long-lost letter or from holding a poet's letter from um, from a long time ago, then then the elegiac note is right now, isn't it, that we're, lo we're, we're losing something that we we value? I suppose we are. I mean, I sign the letters... And yes, and, and I mean, I like to think that the way I use words, I can put enough of myself into the letter that it doesn't matter that it isn't handwritten. Nigel Warburton, you, I mean, you, you Twitter, you email. I, I bet you don't handwrite much, do you? I, I do. I, I write notes. I, I anything intimate, I would write. A po I wouldn't type a postcard. Right? Would you? Uh, no. So there are plenty of times when I do use a pen. Sadly, I, I wouldn't pens. send a postcard. I mean, I think postcards must be in trouble alongside handwriting, I have to say. Well, are we sure that handwriting actually is in trouble? I think my children write by hand at school. It's not as if they're allowed to take a laptop into the classroom I at will, primary school. I will say there was a survey um, six months ago that said that... Um, 40% of the people asked, I think they asked 1,000 or 2,000 people, 40% of them hadn't written anything by hand in the last six months. I was talking to someone very much younger. He, he's 20. And what he said to me was very... He said, but I, if you type the letter A, you just press a button and A comes. If you write it, and he wrote it in there, if you write it, you're making it. Oh, and I thought, he's hit the button. I just want to ask Wendy, who you are obviously a little bit uncomfortable about your own handwriting, but I, I was thinking that of the dear friends who I know and have known for years, if I see their handwriting, I don't think, is that elegant handwriting? It's just their handwriting, and it's like a little path of love and friendship to That's them. Don't you think people feel like that about your handwriting? I d too bad. I don't want to have to slow down and spend ages right now. And, you know, because I, 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 mean, I, really, if I, I do send postcards, but if I'm going to send someone a postcard, I have to buy two postcards because I'll probably get it wrong on the first one and, and then I'll have a, a better, you know. And when I'm going to handwrite, you know, letters of condolence, as you mentioned in your book, we, you know, we all think we have to handwrite those. But I will sometimes draft them on the computer first and then copy them out slowly by hand. And, Diana, the process of actually writing letters... Um, I mean, there are there are various references in your book to how many pages you filled up and so on, and then you put them to one side and you bring them back again. Um, that some has that process gone now that you email? Yes, I miss it. Mm. I miss it. it. Was it was a almost physical pleasure to do it. And someone quoting from the book the other day in a magazine, it quoted two letters. One putting it into into type, and the other is a facsimile of my writing. Mm. And I looked at it and I was so, <laughs> so pleased. Yes. I thought, oh, I like that so much better. I made that. Uh, you, uh, you formed it, as your 20-year-old as friend said. So. I looked at it and I thought, I like that writing, and I was so pleased. Wendy, we're talking, obviously, about the difference between uh, what is physical and what is digital, um, and thus, to a certain extent, about, uh, about books and what you hold in your hand. Um, you have a poem, Closing the Anthology, which I, th you know, I think this would be a good moment to hear it. Right. Closing the Anthology. I wonder if it's time to throw away the green and orange jacket gaudy clothing of its youth, and let it be a sober adult following its ancestors into the navy, gold braid gleaming on a flawless uniform. In time it will grow shabby, the binding slack, and I shall need spectacles to read it. Later, brown spots will appear on the pages, and someone in a dusty shop will open it at the flyleaf. I wish I'd written my name more carefully, in Indian ink. Hmm. That's lovely. Thank you. I, uh, a relative of mine gave me a tiny little volume of Herbert's poems not so long ago, which had been known by Gladstone. Wow. And having W.E. Gladstone just oh. written in the fly leaf, it, it, I'm, I'm reading them differently. You know, I'm going back to read those poems, and the fact that it was once his 
and there is the Indian ink in the flyleaf makes a difference. Yes. Not in the flyleaf, of course, because it's inside the book, but, but yeah. Oh, it does make a difference. But then it is probably sentimental. Mm. I mean, I, it is sentimental. I love Byron's letters more than anything, and the idea of if I had the chance to actually see one of his letters, hold it in his handwriting. I would absolutely faint with joy. And that's nonsense, really. I don't know why I'm nonsense. not surprised to know that you love Byron, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> um, Wendy, we talked about um, how you handwrite poems yeah. and you do the drafts of the poems. Um, what about prose? What about, um, you know, the rest of life's business? Well, pr pr I used to do what Diana did. I used to, if I was doing a book review or something, start it by hand because somehow the f thoughts flowed better. And then I typed the first paragraph, and then I generally carry on just typing. One thing about, you know, because when you're writing articles, it's generally to length, and so a great benefit of the computer is the word count. Absolutely. Yes, that's my You know, I mean, there was a time when I used to, you know, if I was writing something, I'd be going two, four, six, <laughs> you know, I mean, and you don't have to do I've that anymore. That. Yeah. There was a lot of press coverage when you um, sold your archive to the British Library, and it included around... 40,000 emails. And these emails, what kind of email are, are well, these? Well, a lot of them are extremely boring, of course. And, you know, a lot of them, I mean, a lot of them are just business emails. Um, some of them, someone wrote an, wrote an article about my archive. And, I mean, they, they said, you know, there's things like emailing the, the local council about recycling, that kind of thing. Um, I was, I mean, so that you don't think I'm a complete rat, I have to emphasise that I did go through all these emails and also all the letters, putting into a closed file anything that would cause anybody any embarrassment of any kind. Some of it was poets being rude about other poets. Which, like. which, which happens occasionally, I'm, I'm told. <laughs> as, I'm, we know. <laughs> as we know. Um, but is, does it also include um, email exchanges about... Um, the trade of, of of writing poetry with other poets does it include I that think sort of there's stuff? a bit yes I think there's a bit um, about about that um, and opinions about stuff we've been reading and so on um, mm. yes a certain amount of that and of course the great thing about an email archive is that you get both sides of it because you know earlier there's lots and lot I kept I do keep letters and I've got lots of letters from interesting people um, but I didn't take carbons of my letters in the days when I didn't have a computer so with the email you do get both sides of the correspondence. How is the uh, British Library preserving it? Is it preserving it in electronic form? Yeah, it, it's more yeah. actually more difficult I'm told than preserving a paper archive. Oh yes, yes. Um, so because they they, they have to keep recopying it mm. because um, it, it deteriorates. Yes, it's one of the arguments against the uh, against electronic media that it's very ephemeral. There was the famous case of the BBC's um, Doomsday Project in 1986, mm. which uh, I think 15 years later proved to be completely unreadable. The technology had just changed so much. Right. So, well, probably they should have... If they'd looked after mm. it um, and transferred it, it would have been all right, wouldn't it? Yes, and, I, think, yeah. I think there's, uh, there's, a, there's a learning experience. I think the British here. Library will look after. It's mm. a, British, a problem, surely, simply of mass of material. Mm. I, I have in, almost I, insuperable. Yes. I have in front of me something written by Sophie Baldock, who's the PhD student who is helping to catalogue uh, catalog your the archive. I referred to, yeah. um, and and she's very interesting here. She says, I mean, she's she, she sort of defends the email, um, and she says that uh, more so than letters, emails mimic speech and can result in a series of pithy exchanges that may give a researcher or biographer a picture of how their subject behaves in informal and unguarded moments. So that's. Yeah. I try not to be too unguarded in email, actually. <laughs> and I think a lot of people are a bit careful because a lot of people realise email isn't really a very secure medium. And I was surprised how little there was among emails, much less than among letters, that had to be put into a closed file. You've, you've, but I do, I do find correspondence... I mean, the whole business of correspondence I find so much easier now that we... If I get a business letter from someone who hasn't put an email address on it, I'm quite annoyed. I mean, dealing with the post takes less time than it used to, much less. And I'm also in touch with a much wider variety of people because you can just quickly send them a little message and you don't have to you know, write the address and find a stamp and go to the post box and all yes. that. And So I am actually in touch with f more people in you know, different parts of the world. As long as you're disciplined enough not to do it late at night while drunk. Oh. Uh, that's the most important thing. Well, I actually helped, wrote a poem. You um, did. That, that, yes, yes, you've I'm seen that I'm trying to find it. Don't, it's not in the book. But it, it has a refrain, don't answer emails when you're drunk. Yes, yeah, I think that's, that's very sound. There is a sense of... There's a downside to that infinite availability, isn't there, that uh, people can email you and they expect a response, whereas 
before you could take your time over it, you could think over it. Actually, yes. another thing I love about email is it has largely liberated me from the telephone. And when people used to ring up and ask me to do things on the telephone, I would sometimes say yes to things because I couldn't think of an excuse. You know, but with email, actually, you don't have to answer it straight away. And if someone asks you to do something, you do have time to sort of pluck up the courage to ask for more money or say, find some excuse for not doing it. So I think I prefer it in that respect to the telephone. It strikes me that this conversation may already sound very, very fuddy-duddy because we're not talking about texting um, uh, rather than emailing. And, of course, a lot of people just use text now. I do that too. And, and, and that seems to me that the, the point that your um, uh, archivist was making about the speed and spontaneity also applies to texting, doesn't it? I mean, you can have extraordinary conversations yes. that go on and on and on, just a few uh, sentences each. And no-one's going to preserve those, I don't think. Which is possibly a pity, because if you're yeah. looking for the authentic, you know, the authentic uh, music of Byron having a furious argument yeah. with one of his mistresses, it might come better through texts, as it were. Yes. Than but letters. if it had been a telephone conversation, it would have been preserved. If it had been a personal conversation, it wouldn't have been preserved no. either. So. No, no, no. Um... Nigel, when you're, um, uh, you, you blog a lot, and you wrote a very early blog saying one day there's going to be these fantastic e-books coming along and everything is going to be better. We'll be able to... Um, and, of course, you were proved right. Um, but do you feel no sense of loss when it comes to the, the relative decline of handwriting? Because, uh, I mean, whether or not there are lots of people still writing by hand and doing it rather well, in the culture, it is declining. I felt a greater sense of loss with the, the death of the typewriter, which was something that happened very abruptly. Um, handwriting hasn't declined to the extent where people don't do it, whereas anybody who uses a typewriter now seems like a dinosaur, really. Wilson. And Well, mm. they're mm. case in point. Well, I think, Diane, at one point you, you, you have a sort of hunt through the second-hand shops of London trying to find the last typewriter ribbons the of the kind... <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you can't get them. Thankful to be free of that. What I wonder is how much, as it, I mean, everyone is going to go on expressing themselves. Everyone is going to want the, the art of conveying information, the art of telling stories, it's never going to die. And I don't think it matters very much, really, in the end, what the method is. But how much is the change of method going to change what is being expressed? Because it's going to, in a way... I think the discovery of print, for instance, made an immense difference into what people expressed and how they expressed it. And surely there'll be this, a consequence of this eventually. Nigel? Well, I would say one of the interesting things that happens with the writing of prose, certainly, I'm not sure how much this happens with creative writers, is that it's so easy to exchange a document with somebody while it's work in progress. So I can send to somebody I trust, I can send my latest chapter, get comments on it, have a dialogue with them and get back to working on it within a few hours, if they're generous, um, within weeks or whatever. But they can receive it almost instantaneously. So there's a sense in which I don't have to go out and post it, type it out. I can just decide to share something with someone, get feedback and build that in. Now, I'd be really interested to know, if, as a writer, there's the equivalent of Ezra Pound out there for... Elliot, giving the feedback, I don't know. No, I'm, it's, my partner's a poet, and so it's mainly done by walking upstairs to his study. Or oh, actually, but sometimes, because we're so lazy, I do sometimes. Yeah, I do, actually. I mean, this poem, when I thought about this one, and I, I wanted someone just to say, because I wrote it ages ago, and I wanted someone to tell me, is, is this OK to go on the radio? So I emailed it to him upstairs. I did yeah. the same. My wife's my best <laughs> critic, and yeah. we exchange emails yeah. of yeah. each other's writing. Philip I, don't any, I don't think anyone's doubting the convenience and the speed and efficiency of uh, electronic communications, but... There's a way in which it's become a much more public medium from the start. Um, the way in which those aspects of privacy of a text, when you hand a handwritten note from one person to another, that's disappearing. There's also the case with e-books that you don't own them. 
that you're, they're loaned to you by um, by the the publisher. You can't actually bequeath a collection of e-books to your heirs in the way that you can a library. You, they don't really belong to you in the, that kind of psychic sense. Now I know that you know to a philosopher we're talking he's going to be more interested in abstract ideas, but to a creative writer, the substance of words, the physical element, it has an important aspect. I think, and it's a human aspect. I think it does to any writer. I don't think you need to underestimate that for a philosopher. The, the process, the physical process of writing on a typewriter, you know, Hemingway had a kind of muscular approach to typing. Some people, the flutter of the keys is important to the way they compose. Some people write with a pencil on yellow paper. They're just different ways of doing things. So I wouldn't want to generalise about all philosophers or all creative writers. I think what we have is a range of possibilities, some of them very exciting. Um, handwriting is good for intimate communication. It's not particularly good for long um, prose exchanges uh, when the other person has to know precisely the words you were using. I'm quite interested in the, the business of fast um, I, I, either comments or editing or a conversation going on. You've got something like 26,000 Twitter followers. You also blog um, and presumably get lots and lots of comments back um, in the world of philosophy. And you make the point somewhere, I think, that Socrates, for instance, didn't believe in writing. He thought he thought all, all philosophy should be conversation, should be oral. Um, but would you be a happy man if you never had another book of philosophy published? Well, actually, I, the main thing that I do now is um, I podcast, mm. and that's the spoken word. I interview philosophers for a podcast called Philosophy Bites. And to me, the quality of the voice is something similar to what you're talking about with the quality of the expressed personality through the way somebody forms their letters, that you learn all sorts of things about the person and their style of thinking that you couldn't get from the page. And I think Socrates was right. It's much more sensitive to um, the person who's asking the question. Socrates said that um, written words look intelligent, but you keep asking them different questions. They reply the same way, always the same way, the same words, whereas a human being in a room can listen to what you're saying, try and explain it a different way, clarify something for you. So for me, one of the ideal ways of communicating philosophy would be through the spoken word, through conversation, and and, th and through that sort of use of the voice and um, ideally mm -hmm. synchronous interchange. But if we make judgments about people on the basis of their handwriting, how much more would we make judgments about them if we could always see their face and hear their tone of voice? We might dislike the, the accent or um, the way they look. That could be a problem. Well, David Hume famously looked stupid. His contemporaries thought he looked stupid. He had a, <laughs> the face of a turtle-eating alderman rather than a, a refined philosopher. So that's a problem. Uh, but it's interesting to know that. Um, and it explains some of the reactions he might have had as well, perhaps. But um, I think there are things in the way that people use language that communicate non-verbally, so through the power of the voice, the emotional expression in the voice. And that's why radio is so fantastic. For anyone it's who's ever been... It's intimate and powerful in that emotional connection with the listener. Anyone who's ever been on a silent retreat will realise how vital how people talk is because you make judgments about the people around the table you haven't heard them speak you you come to a conclusion about what they're like and then at the end of the week you get in a taxi to go to the station and they speak and you're always completely wrong <laughs> and you realize that um, you would have made completely different judgments about them if you'd seen them if you'd heard them talk if you'd heard the timbre of their voice all sorts of things. Um, I would suggest that you might have a better idea about what they were like if you asked them to write write something down in handwriting. We've based almost this entire conversation on the assumption that handwriting is in, in steep decline and retreat, which is which is your contention, Philip. But I wonder, you know, if you're going through a, a railway station or something, there's still these shops selling lots and lots of notebooks and so on, and indeed a pretty wide range of uh, of writing materials, including. I think your favourite of all. Yeah, there's a huge peon of praise and adoration to the Bic Biro halfway oh, through your book. Wonderful isn't thing! This wonderful thing. It's um, it was invented. Uh, it was marketed in the early 1950s, and it's never changed since. It hasn't needed to change, and it still costs exactly the same in cash terms. In cash terms, that it did in 1961. It's an extraordinary object. It is one of those things like sort of yogurt. 
um, which if it was much, much more expensive, people would value it more probably and, and still get more, you know, the same use and enjoyment. It's almost too, too cheap a bit it's of buyer, isn't cheap. it? Yes. Yeah. I mean, when the ballpoint's no, pen... I think it's so cheap. No, having oh, read your no. book... I'm reverent about them. Oh, well, when, they, when ballpoint pens were first marketed after the Second World War, in this country they cost uh, £2.15, shillings, which was a respectable secretarial salary. Um, and when uh, the, the Baron Bick started marketing them, you know, you, can buy, you could buy 100 for almost nothing. Mm. It's, they're wonderful things, and they're so beautifully constructed. Wendy Coke. One of my favourite stories about writing implements is that when Americans started sending people into space, they put enormous resources into trying to develop some kind of pen that would write in space. And you think they sometimes come up in mail. The Russians just used pencils. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> a dastardly <laughs> trick. <laughs> Nigel, a final thought from you. Handwriting and the computer aren't necessarily poles apart in one sense. I mean, the, uh, there are iPad handwriting recognition apps that you can get which will you can write with a stylus and they will pick it up and they'll store it either as handwriting or put it into standard font uh, so i think there's a recognition that handwriting is can be important for note taking mm. and, so and that that's recognized um on the ipad yes well of course um though we use the term digital um, a lot. There is nothing more digital than handwriting. It is, it is literally the hand and the wrist and the fingers. But we now use it in a different um, context. And indeed, um, uh, like so many other programmes, we will expect a sort of interactive response uh, from everybody listening or some people listening and so on. That is the world we live in. I think we're going to finish, however, with Wendy Cope's response to this world in a little poem you wrote, Wendy, called Digital and Interactive. The producer wants me to write about digital and interactive. I have tried, but I do not find these subjects attractive. There is a gap, and this attempt to bridge it will be all there is on interactive or on digital. <laughs> <laughs> Wendy Cope, thank you very much, and thank you indeed to all of my guests. Nigel Warburton, and you can find his Philosophy Bites podcast on the web. Wendy Cope's latest collection is Family Values. Diana Athill's Instead of a Book, Letters to a Friend, is out in paperback, and Philip Hensher's The Missing Ink, The Lost Art of Handwriting and Why It Still Matters, is out now. Next week, The State of America, with Richard Ford, Lionel Shriver and Edward Luce. But for now, thank you and goodbye. With pen and ink, that that leads on to all sorts of creative thinking, to a deeper engagement with words, to a bit a bit more understanding of how things how things are written. Um, all that seems to be swept aside in the kind of grasp of this brave new world of mm. texting and typing and emailing. Well, let's probe that a little further because some people would say this is. Uh, romanticism. This is sentimentality. The smell of the paper, the feel of the ink, you know, the, 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 the heft of a pen or a pencil in your finger. All wonderful, all sensual, but actually not necessarily much to do with thinking or indeed uh, writing words. Well, sentimentality is just a word that you use for a feeling that you're declining to join in with, I think. <laughs> um, uh, let me give you an example. A couple of weeks ago, I was I picked up an old copy of Vanity Fair that I'd had for decades, and out of it fell a little handwritten note that my sister had left for me when I was in... Literati is relaxed and enthused by the new penless, pencil-free world. But we're going to start with the man whose new book has set us on this week's path, the novelist and critic Philip Henshaw, who has written The Missing Ink, a history of handwriting with elegiac notes and a brief manifesto for its revival. Philip, you pose the question about how much handwriting we see these days, and it's a good one. I'm sure lots of people will be thinking about it uh, already. But it's certainly the case that handwriting is still being taught in schools, isn't it? To a certain extent. I think there's uh, there's some requirement in the national curriculum that um, that students learn to write, but there's less and less enthusiasm for it. For years, there's been a strong argument that um, children don't need this anymore, they should just learn to type. 
And the research that uh, has gone into um, educational theory that demonstrates quite convincingly that if children learn how to make a le- hospital when I was 15 mm. and I must have been reading Vanity Fair, it was just a completely unremarkable note saying, I saw that you fell asleep and I'm just, I'll, I'll be back later today, hope you're mm. feeling better. Love, Kate. And that was it, really. Now, that was from 32 years ago. It was absolutely full of her personality. I saw it and I knew immediately who left it for me. If she'd sent me a text message, would I still have it after 32 years? Would I still have that connection to my past, to her past, to our relationship? I wonder. I asked about, uh, right at the beginning, how many people could recognise their friend's handwriting, but recognising something about the personality... Um, in the handwriting is very much part of the case you make. Yes, it's uh, it's a fraught case because the science of graphology is so eccentric and people making um, points about how good someone is with money from the angle of their capital H or whatever. But there's no doubt that when we see a piece of handwriting... Thank you for downloading the Start the Week podcast from BBC Radio 4. For more information, go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. Hello. Think of your friends. Can you recognise their handwriting? When did you last see their handwriting? Have you ever? Today we're going to be talking about what may be becoming a lost art and asking whether it really matters. The venerable author Diana Atthill published her letters to a poet friend in New York instead of a book, she called it, and during the long correspondence she moves from paper to screen. The poet, Wendy Cope, has written quite a lot about writing, postcards, flyleaf inscriptions, the poetry itself, but her archive, sold to the British Library, contains, apart from 15 boxes of paper, about 40,000 emails. Nigel Warburton, who lectures in philosophy and is a leading light of the Twitter... Someone we know well, or even someone we've never met before, um, we have some kind of sense of their humanity. There's some Mm. sense of what they might be like as human beings. I think some of these things we all agree on. I think if you saw somebody whose handwriting leans backwards, then you often have the sense they might be a little bit withdrawn... If they um, if they paint their letters, if they don't join up, often I think the people are very uh, are probably a little bit visual, visually um, um, inclined. They're obviously often visually creative. Um, but and if to, they put, and if they put little hearts instead of dots above their eyes, then somebody ought to have a word with them. <laughs> <laughs> um, part of your book is very, is the fascinating history of the teaching of handwriting and all the various methods and gurus and so on who became popular um, and and persuaded people to teach in different kinds of ways. So so, so there is a um, there's a generational and indeed geographical issue here about how people handwrite. But there's also a 